We'll prepare ourselves this morning in our usual fashion while having a few moments of silent prayer. And during that time, we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, during this time, it's important that if you have any particular issue that you are dealing with, any problem, any testing, whatever, be sure to check it with the Lord because otherwise your mind is going to drift and you're going to be thinking about your problem while I'm giving you solutions. I'm not. The Word of God is. And so... Let's clear the deck of anything that might be lurking about in our soul that would keep us from concentrating. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and feed upon your mighty word. We thank you for your word. It reveals the great and mighty things that otherwise we would have no clue about the past. We thank you that you have filled in the blanks and it gives us confidence and courage and the ability to become overcomers even in the devil's world. So we do pray that you will help us to keep our focus Concentrate as you reveal your mighty word, for we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In Genesis chapter 5, we have some genealogy that we've already gone over, but I found a chart that I think we'll, you'll find interesting. It's... Um, kind of self-explanatory, and we'll only be on it for a moment. It's the antediluvian chronology. Antediluvian comes from two words, anti before and diluvian from the deluge or flood. So this is before the flood chronology referring to time in a sequence. And what it's doing is starting with Adam and it's showing from Genesis chapter 5 when the, his offsprings were born and when they died. Starting with Adam, then you have Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. And you can see that if you take this line from Adam here and you come straight down... It's over here into Lamech's life, which was Noah's father, just short of Noah. Adam died just not that long before uh, Noah was born. But when you add all these up, and what this is showing is from the creation of Adam all the way to the flood, it says if there is no uh, gaps in this genealogy, then the flood occurred 1,656 years um, after the, after the creation, after Adam was created. So I just thought y'all might think that was uh, interesting. And that's, that is conditioned if there's no gaps in between there, but that is uh, what I want you to see. Okay, now we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And let's just start with verse 1. We've already gone through verses 1 through 3. But we'll reread those to bring us up to speed. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the earth, on the face of the land... The daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, you should have that underlined, we spent some time on that. The Hebrew there is Banaha Elohim, and it's referring to angels, specifically fallen angels in this case, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, 
They were girl watchers. And they took wives of themselves, whomever they chose. That's this interesting part there. They took wives, whoever they chose. Sounds like they maybe were polygamous, that they had more than one wife. And they probably didn't have a hard time finding women that would be willing to marry them because angels are phenomenal creatures of beings they're just when they are in their normal condition when you see in the bible that uh someone sees an angel what do they do they just fall down on their face and they just sh they just shake they're extremely frightened they're f magnificent creatures so when these angels were able to um, take on the form of uh, a man uh, they would no doubt uh, beautiful, uh, strong, charming, all the rest. Verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now what this is saying is that God is going to give the human race 120 years to accept the gospel as it was given then, which we've gone several times to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where you have the first promise of a Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. He was going to give them 120 years to accept that, and then judgment would come. And as we always see in the Bible, that grace always precedes justice. It was here and it always is so. So now we go to Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And before I want to go, I go any further, some of you probably reading Bibles like the King James Bible. It doesn't say Nephilim. It says giants were in the land. Y'all have Any of y'all have a translation that says that? Well, if you do, what happened? Nephilim is a transliteration of the Hebrew word, or actually a translation of it. It's, uh, they just take the letters that were there and they put them into English where we can understand them. If you have a Bible that says giants, that is a translation. They translated it giants, but that was just kind of a, a, a guess. Uh, the, the term Nephilim is... A somewhat obscure and so they they probably got the uh, transla translation giants because as you go on you see that these um, Nephilim um, were big and strong and they were called uh, heroes but not in the sense of uh, being heroes saving the day but heroes in the sense of famous they were well known so the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, and I'm, you, if you want to, you can cross that part out because I'm, I'll get to this. The translation, uh, according to R.B. Theme Jr., uh, which is uh, an expert in the Hebrew and the Greek, says that is an idiomatic phrase that means because, not uh, and also afterward, but because when the sons of man came in to the daughters of men, excuse me, the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, that would be these fallen angels, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now let's look at this a little closer. Nephilim, the, the word Nephilim, or the name, is... Uh, means fallen ones. It comes from nafal. And it, nafal means fallen. And so you have the nafalim. The, and that's where they get the fallen ones. These were the ones who had uh, fallen from the human race. They were no longer pure human strain, human genetically and so forth. They were half angel and half human. That doesn't mean half of their body was an angelic and the other half uh, was man. It just means that they were no longer pure humanity. 
And so they fell from the human race and were no longer humanity. They were the offspring of the fallen angels who had cohabited with the women. Now some versions, like I said, have a giants instead of Nephilim. From the Eastern Bible Dictionary, it says the Hebrew word was left untranslated. Uh, however, uh, they translated the Hebrew Giborim, G-I-B-B-O-R-I-M, in Genesis 6-4 as mighty men. So these Nephilim were mighty men. Mighty in the sense of being stronger, bigger, faster, more intelligent, the whole thing. And that's what you would expect from if there were uh, some kind of offspring from these angels and women. They would certainly be uh, uh, superior to the normal man. The, Nephilim, the word Nephilim is used only here and in Numbers 13.33. In Numbers 13.33, you have it used, uh, I, I say, as hyperbole. It's when the, the spies went into the land of Canaan to spy out to see if it's everything that they had anticipated. Joshua had sent them over there, and they came back, and they got a, a report that said, indeed, the land is everything that we heard that it would be. In the idiomatic phrase, it's a, a land flowing with milk and honey. Grapes the size of basketballs. Um, they didn't say that, but I'm just saying that's... They were using exaggeration. And then... There was one word that changed everything, and it usually does, and the word is but. They said there are Nephilim in the land. Some translations there say giants, but the word there is Nephilim. And they said that the Nephilim uh, are huge. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. Do you understand that that's exaggeration? They weren't really little grasshoppers. They're exaggerating, saying we were grasshoppers in their sight because they are Nephilim. Now, the well-known and famous Nephilim of the antediluvian period, their notoriety had, had, had gone on into after the flood because Noah and his sons carried the message with them, and he, he would tell... The, uh, the, in fact, his sons would see it as well. They all would be able to relay the message about what we will see in a few moments that became mythological. That uh, a lot of mythology was based on some truth. We'll get to that in a moment. So what I'm saying is if, if people say, where, and they came later, with the Nephilim later, after the flood, of course... When Joshua was taking the Israelites into Canaan, this is way after the flood. And the reason this is important, because if God did not wipe out all the Nephilim, all the creatures of this, of, of this union between fallen angels and mankind, then we would still have a huge problem. And we know absolutely, unequivocally, that no Nephilim survived. Because in at least a couple of places, it dogmatically states that there were only eight that survived the flood. That means every other living thing, except maybe for fish, were, were killed during the flood. So that means there could not be any Nephilim that would go into the land. Do you understand that? That would be uh, ridiculous to think. Where, where did the Nephilim come from? Because Noah and his family, those eight, were the only people. And they were, they were not tainted by this angelic invasion into the genetic pool of humanity. So they would, this is, there's no basis for to think that the Nephilim in Numbers 13, 33 
was anything more than exaggeration, which they in the same sentence are exaggerating about themselves as being grasshoppers. Okay, the Nephilim could not have survived the flood because there's only eight members of Noah's family survived. Here's two verses that prove or state that there were only eight. Eight humans. 1 Peter 3.20 and 2 Peter 2.5. Those are, only two, those are two places that say dogmatically nothing survived the flood other than these eight and the animals that were on the ark with them. And maybe the fish. Doesn't say anything about the fish, but I don't think that a flood would kill the fish. So the word, uh, the, the term also afterwards is a Hebraic idiom that could be translated this was the cause or just because. Now, in our verse, you'll see that it says those were the mighty men. The Nephilim were much bigger and stronger than normal men. Uh, the Faith Life Study Bible says, quote, Greek mythology reflects this understanding, telling the story of the gigantes being products of the human, uh, of the union of earth and heaven. In other words, they're saying that these uh, Greek mythology is based on the deity and the human coming together. And I looked up this word, G-I-G-A-N-T-E-S, and I thought at first, well, it sounds like it's Greek, and it would be probably pronounced gigantes, where we get the word gigantic. And I was, I was surprised. I went into the New Testament and I have my search engines, and I search, search for the word giant, and giant is not even in the New Testament anywhere. The word giant isn't there. And I thought, boy, that surprises me. So I, uh, I don't know the origin of this gigantes, G-I-G-A-N-T-E-S, but of course it's talking about uh, giants. I'm going to give you a, another quote from... Schaefer Theological Seminary Journal, number 11, Bible Sources, Truth or Myth, Part 1. I'm, not giving, I'm just giving you a little slice of this, of this quoting from the Schaefer Theological Journal. It says, quote, This brief description of antediluvian times refers to the existence of of legendary heroes, perhaps even those mentioned in classical literature, like Hercules, Achilles, and others. The heroes are the offspring of the union of fallen angels, commonly referred to in secular literature as the gods and human women. The pantheon of Greece and Rome pay homage, homage to this time as does the Mesopotamian literature. Genesis 6-4 validates the existence of these heroes without specifically affirming the truth content of any secular myths. So what it's saying here is essentially is that you've heard of these mythological uh, characters, Hercules and Aeschylus and um, Homer and all these others, and it's, what it's saying is that they're not saying that the Bible substantiates the myths, but it says the myths are based on something. It's not just something that uh, came out of the clear blue. In essence, God says, yes, there were angelic human beings. And so that's what mythology is based on, uh, the demigods, the deity and human combined. Now, as a result, the secular literature of our study seems to gain a limited validity through this single verse. We're talking about Genesis 6-4. The myths cannot be counted as true or equal to the narrative of Genesis 6-9, through 9, but they can now be placed within a time frame of the antediluvian civilization. That's where this mythology came from, was from this time frame of the antediluvian times. <coughs> God's word is true and perfectly reliable, whereas the classical myths are just that and no foundation for life and godliness. 
Eight souls who disembarked from the ark were the only human eyewitnesses of that most ancient of human civilizations. Noah had three sons who had three wives, and all couples had offsprings. These offsprings flourished and spread throughout the earth, and with them they carried the oral history of their forefathers. And remember, since Noah's father was a contemporary of Adam, means that he probably knew Adam, talked to Adam, and he got a lot more information than if, as if he was just relying on uh, stories, that, oral stories that were given uh, hundreds, maybe uh, several hundred years prior to him, his time. While the classical myths are written versions of the oral histories passed down from the offspring of Noah's family, the genitive narrative of that time is completely accurate. It's an accurate account of the events under the guiding hand of God the Holy Spirit. There is no embellishment, no change, and no loss of anything that God wanted to say about that time. And by the way, this article was written by Mark Perkins, which is a fellow Texican. He, he used to live over there close to, uh, he had a church over there close to Where's that? Um, Huntsville. I've talked to him a few times, he, and I have several of his books. So if you see something that's written by Mark Perkins, you might want to check it out. So what we're saying here essentially is all of the things that came from, uh, that we hear about mythological uh, narratives, they're, they are prompted by the Nephilim who were truly super creatures. And we don't know all that they did, but we, your imagination can get carried away, and I think that's essentially what happened when Noah's, and Noah's sons carried the, the, the stories, the narrative about the Nephilim. Then there would be people who said, uh, the more times a story is told, the more easy it is to be embellished maybe even exaggerate, but they have, they're have rooted in fact that they were these super creatures. Okay, Genesis chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Then the law, Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Now you can imagine this is going to take a little explanation, but let's zero in on chapter 5, ver, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 5. The law saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I want you to put a bookmarker there in your, where you are in Genesis 6. And I want you to turn to Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1. Now, you won't see this in your scripture, in, in, your, in your text. But it, this appears to be a psalm that David wrote concerning 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 38. So what I did, right under where it says Psalm 14, I have a little box there, and it says 1 Samuel, 1 S-A-M, period, 25, chapter 25, verse 38. I have that in a lot of the Psalms. For instance, Psalm 16 is from 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 5. And you can go there, and David wrote these psalms because of the experiences he had. And he's relating these experiences in song. And it's nice to know what experience is he relating it to. So in Psalm 14, is related to 1 Samuel 25, verse 38. And that chapter has to do when David had an encounter with Nabal which was the husband of Abigail, which David eventually married. Quite a story there. But let's start with 
first of all, for the choir director, a psalm of David. So David wrote this psalm. The first line says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Now I want you to draw a circle or underline the word fool there. And the Hebrew word for fool is Nabal. N-A-B-A-L. Who was David having an issue with? Nabal. Abigail said, yes, my husband's name is Nabal, fool, and a fool he is. Nabal was a Nabal, in other words. Oh, I see some wrinkled brows. <laughs> it just is saying that the word, if you trans translate Nabal, it means fool. And David was dealing with a fool. I, I, probably I need to give you a little more information. That's why the wrinkled brows. Nabal hired David to, have, to, to provide security for his flocks, for his house. David went and did that, and when it was time to get paid, Nabal reneged. And so David was not happy about that. He and his men decided they were going to get their pound of flesh and whatever else they needed as, for payment. And he was enraged. He was on the way there to... Uh, wiped Nabal out and Abigail heard about it and she got a donkey and she put all this food and fruit and everything on a, on a donkey. She goes out and meets David on the road before he gets there. And she's very uh, humble and submissive to him, calling him my Lord. And she said, that's when she tells him, uh, my husband is Nabal, fool, and he is what his name says he is. He's a fool for doing this. But please, uh, don't make a big mistake here and seek revenge. Re who who is got a, a cornered the market has a monopoly on revenge? God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. So he, she talks him in, not into, uh, she talks him into not taking revenge on Nabal. And he just is so taken with her. So she goes back home, and Nabal dies, and David winds up marrying her. That's the, sh the short of it. And that's what this, this psalm starts out about, okay? So the fool, Nabal, has said in his heart, there is no God. I like to say that whenever somebody tells me that they're atheist, I ask them, do you know what the Bible says about those who claim they're atheist? I don't know if that's a good idea, but I can't resist So the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Sounds a little bit like Genesis 6, 5, doesn't it? The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men, of the human race, to see if there are any who understand. Who seek after God. Actually that means that keep seeking after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. This is referring to unbelievers. And doesn't it sound very much like what Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 is saying. There's not one that is not corrupted and contemptible. So I just thought I'd throw that in to show you how that goes along with what we're studying in Genesis 6-4. Now before we go back to Genesis uh, excuse me, 6-5, I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Peter is way back there close to the end of the Bible. Now, one reason I went to this verse, there's a couple of reasons, but one reason is because what we can glean from Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, where God is just going to wipe them out. None of them are good. 
we would say in colloquial language, they were all no damn good. They were just all... Uh, and, and what I want you to also see is why in this particular period they were so violent. We're going to see in a minute. They were violent. They were uh, wicked. If you have a group that is stronger and bigger, smarter than another group, what is probably going to take place? They're probably going to take advantage of the weaker group. And I'm talking about the Nephilim were superior to regular, regular uh, humans, and so violence spread. And they all were, that, er, er, all the thoughts of their mind continually were wicked. And the fact that you had these Nephilim that were uh, spreading all this is one reason why it was so, uh, uh, so bad. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For if God did not spare angels, now that if is a first class conditional clause and could be translated since. It means if and it's true. So since God did not spare the angels when they sinned. Now what is that talking about? Here we find this in the latter part of the New Testament and it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 through 5. You were talking about the fallen angels who sinned in this most grievous way. They went outside of the rules of engagement and God is going to punish them. Or he did punish them. For since God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them down to, your translation says hell, but remember we went over this already, Tartarus. Tartarus is a location, I'll show you a PowerPoint on that in a moment. And committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So that was their penalty. They were cast into Tartarus, this place located in Hades. Well, I guess I better do this now because this will be an opportune time to do it. Some of you have seen this before, but some of you may have not seen it. So uh, I'm going to put it on the board. I talked about it last Sunday, but I'm going to show it to you here today. This is the compartments of hell. Hell in the English, really in the Greek, it's uh, Hades, and in the uh, uh, Hebrew, it's Sheol. I don't know why I put hell there. I meant to put Hades. I just now saw that for the first time. <laughs> H-A-D-E-S is the Greek word for Hades and Sheol. And sometimes in the, in the English they just put hell. But there are three compartments. First of all, you have Abraham's bosom, also called paradise. This is where Old Testament believers, when they die, their soul went here. And uh, this is uh, Abraham's bosom is called that in Luke 16, 22. And paradise is referred to in Luke 2343. Now between this place in this netherland, the underworld, you have a great gulf fix. This is talking about Luke 16, 26 says this. This is for believers. This is the compartment for unbelievers. And Lazarus could look across this great chasm this, that no one could go from one pl uh, place to the other. And he could see, he could even talk to people in torment. And torments is for all unbelievers. This is uh, Luke 16, verse 28. And so, uh, what we, let, let's go back here for a moment. This place, Abraham's bosom or paradise, is no longer occupied because when Jesus ascended in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10, appears that he emptied all of the Old Testament believers, their souls, out of here and took them, took them with him to heaven. To the third heaven. Now this is the new paradise. This is for all believers. Both believers in the church age. In the New Testament era. As well as Old Testament. Will be in heaven. The, the Old Testament believers are already there. You will be there someday. And I will too. If we die. That's where we'll go. If the Lord returns while we're still alive. We'll just be translated into a resurrection body. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 4, uses the term new paradise. So that's where all Old Testament believers are today. They have to be there because when Christ returns at the second advent, he's bringing them back with him to earth. So they have to be there for him to be able to bring them back. 
That's where they are. Now, the last compartment here is, uh, oh, by the way, let me finish this arrow here, torments here. The reason that all these unbelievers are held in this location called torments is because they're waiting judgment. And there will be a time, according to Revelation chapter 20, of the great white throne judgment, they will be uh, resurrected and they will stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne. This is Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Why are they there? Don't tell me because of sin. If you do, you need to... They're there because they rejected the gospel. That's why they're here. And when they're here, they're going to be judged according to their what? Works. God is going to judge them on what they want to be judged by. They rejected Christ's perfect work. And they're standing and relying on their own works, which God sees as filthy rags. And his own justice requires that they then be tossed down here into the lake of fire. I'll get to that in a moment. Now, Tartarus is for Genesis fallen angels, and you have these two scriptures here as well. They're in a holding place as well. I don't think that there's going to be any judgment for them. They're just staying, cooling, I would say cooling their heels, but it's probably hot there. I don't know. We know it's dark. Uh, Anyhow, they're there until the end of the human uh, of the uh, plan of God for humans at, at, at Earth before it is uh, remade, uh, renewed, and they're waiting for the time when they are actually the the execution of their verdict. We know they were found guilty according to Matthew twenty five verse forty one. They have been sentenced. But the sentence wasn't carried out because God is demonstrating to the entire universe that he was just in sentencing Satan and his fallen angels to the lake of fire. And he's showing that man, a lesser creature, but has volition as well. He's proven that he is uh, just in what he does. And so at the end of the, actually it's the end of the millennium when the God revolution is going to take place. He's going to toss all these angels into the lake of fire. A lot of people think this is, when they talk about hell, they think of the lake of fire. But actually, this is hell, these compartments here. The lake of fire is also called the second death. In Hebrew, it's tophet, T-O-P-H-E-T. And in Greek, it's Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A. All unbelievers from every dispensation of all time will be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay? I didn't give you that last time because I didn't put this PowerPoint on. Anybody have any questions over this? Good. All right. Now let's get back to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Are y'all with me? Can y'all switch gears like this? Okay. So when we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, For since God did not spare the angels when they sinned, in Genesis chapter 6, but cast them into Tartarus, now you see all about what Tartarus is about, and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, that's one of the two places that I said for certain. That's all that survived. When he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and again, that is, um, my Bible shows that's in italic, so it's not even there. It just, it's put there for, to read smoothly in English. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, did he condemn them? Yes, he did. To destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. Now let's stop there for just a second. What is Peter saying here? He's saying, look, God didn't have any mercy on these angelic beings that broke the rules of the angelic conflict of engagement of the war there, and he punished them. 
And he punished those of Sodom and Gomorrah. And why, he says, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. Does that apply to us as well? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. This is in the New Testament, <laughs> Peter is saying. In other words, he's showing that you, if you think that you're special as a person, if you think you're special as a nation, forget it. You're not. He's given examples where there were people who may have thought they were special, that they thought they could get by with ignoring God and defying God. He's using these as examples, and he says, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. And then it says in verse 7, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sexual conduct of unprincipled men, for what the, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man while living among them felt his unrighteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. I would have something to say about that. He chose to go there. And he chose to stay there. And if he was tormented, why didn't he move? Anyway, that, that's just my thinking there. Verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly, which he did from the flood. He rescued the, the only believers that were there. The, probably, the, uh, I'm not sure about the, uh, but probably the only true humanity that was left. If he knows how to rescue the godly from, uh, I have temptation. It should be a trials there is a better word. And to keep the unrighteous under punishment from the day of judgment. This all is connected directly into Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. Do you understand why? You have all this ungodliness. You have all these creatures that were exceedingly wicked and violent. And God takes care of them. And he removes them. I think it was Billy Graham who famously said, if God does not judge America, then he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And this should give us pause. When you think of in, in our nation today, we have about half of the population that has gone to the dark side. They are God haters. They hate Christians. They hate Jews. They hate anybody that would stand for righteousness. They think they're free, that they can do anything they want to do without any repercussions. In our own country today, there are Christians who are being persecuted for standing for their faith. We have encoded into our laws perversion and acceptance of evil. We're getting more and more like the description that we see in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. That's what I'm saying. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. I'll tell you what, before, before we do that, uh, I only, I'm looking, I only have so much time, and I, I, want, I wanted to get this in as well. Um, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and you'll see how this is going to connect into what's happening in the time of Noah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 20. I'll put it on the board. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow it there. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all. Underline that. Once for all. This isn't the only place. It's in Hebrews 10 as well. You don't have to go and make sacrifices and do ritual or anything over and over in order to keep your salvation alive Christ died 
for sins, the sins of the entire world, once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Verse 19. In which also he went and made a proclamation to spirits now in prison. Oh, now we're getting read into uh, Genesis chapter 6, aren't we? No, he made a proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Who were these spirits and what prison is he talking about? Is he just talking about he went down into a, a local town and was talking to the prisoners there? No, we know that can't be for, for what follows. Verse 20, he went and made a, a proclamation to the spirits now in prison, now, underlined now, they're there now, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, again, we have these are eight persons were brought safely through the water. Now, I don't know if you un knew this or understood this. Some of you know it. Uh, but what happened was when Jesus Christ died on the cross, they put him in the tomb. He rose from the tomb and in a resurrection body. And in that resurrection body, he made a trip to... First, he, we, we know he went to um, the day that he died, his soul went into uh, Abraham's bosom. How do we know that? What did he tell the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. His soul went into paradise. But after he was resurrected, he made a trip to Tartarus. That's what this is talking about. And he made a proclamation to them. Because they had been in the dark, and I said last Sunday, you know, very clever, <laughs> They not only were in the literal dark, they were in the dark as far as information. They didn't know what was going on. So Jesus Christ, in his victorious resurrection body, went to Tartarus and proclaimed to them that their effort and their plan did not work. That Jesus Christ made it to the cross. He himself made it to the cross as a true human, the God-man, true humanity, an undiminished deity, united in one person forever, but it was his humanity that went to the cross and died for us. And he went to Tartarus to let them know that all your effort was for naught. And now all they are anticipating is at the right time this same Lord and Savior that we have that made that proclamation to them will toss them into the lake of fire. That's what this is talking about. I'm going to read it with after I've explained it to you, starting with verse 19, I'll read it again. In which also he, Jesus Christ, went and made a proclamation, explaining to them that there is no hope for them, their endeavor, their enterprise failed, to the spirits, this is the fallen angels, now in prison. Here is talking about Tartarus as being a prison. Who once were disobedient. Once, way back then, when they infiltrated the human race and became the uh, sons of God who procreated with women. They were disobedient. They went outside the rules of engagement for the angelic conflict there. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. This happened during the time, the 120 years that God told Noah it was going to take. He was built the ark. And the whole time that Noah was building the ark, he was preaching the gospel. The gospel then was that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of Satan. He is the one that will be the Messiah. So... Waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Isn't it amazing how the Bible is all these uh, different things, topics, people. It, it's, it was written over about a 1400 year period by some uh, 
47, 50 authors, something like that. All different, different backgrounds. Most of them didn't know each other, and yet it reads seamless. Here you have Peter in somewhere around, I don't know, I think he wrote this probably somewhere around 60 A.D., something like that. And he's talking about what happened back there in the antediluvian period. How did he know what happened? Because we also have from the Bible that it is God inspired. God inspired the Holy Spirit to write these things for, for us to know. How many people know these things? How many Christians, how many church-going Christians know these things? Very few. And I put that mainly on the pastors because they want to titillate people's ears and make it a big emotional razzmatazz thing instead of getting them the truth that they need that satisfies they, their soul. So we can know God is so gracious to us, we can know what happened way back in the antediluvian period. Even in the New Testament, writers reveal it to us. Why is this important? It's important because we are going to experience the same thing that the Nephilim and the people on earth who rejected Noah all they did was mock Noah. Ha! <laughs> hey, come on. Let's go. We ought to sell tickets. Let's go see that guy building this thing. I, I think he calls it an ark, a boat, or whatever. <laughs> and they, they laugh. Listen, today, if you are in a public place, or sometimes it doesn't matter where you are, and you bring up Jesus Christ, and you profess that you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, that Jesus Christ is going to come back and take you home someday. There's going to be a great period called the tribulation when the, God is going to judge Israel for their rejection of Messiah. And then, then he's going to come back at the second advent and he's going to rule for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. If you say things that, like that around people, what are they going to do? What can you expect if they're kind of nice people, they'll change the subject. But today, there are, people aren't so nice on these things anymore. In fact, this, this, this group, this, I said half the country, are looking more and more like the anti-Diluvian race. Today, if, if you don't go along with their wickedness and their evil. If you stand for truth and righteousness, not only will they attack you verbally, now they're attacking physically. Look at Antifa. Look what's happening in the colleges. Listen, our college kids are under tremendous pressure. It's, everything has, has gone just... In, it's insanity what's happening. And our media... Our universities, academia, Hollywood, and much of our government has gone to the dark side. And God is tolerating it so far. But he's rattling the cage. Earthquakes, fires. We have... Crazy people shooting out of windows and everything. These are, these are warnings that we better wake up. Well, okay, I'm going to read two more verses. Just All I'm going to do is read them with very little commentary. And then we're going to, then, then that'll be the end of verse 5. And then we're going to start next time in verse 6. God was sorry? God repented? We'll see about that next time. But let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 18 through 20. By the way, Matthew is describing believers here. Matthew 15, 18 says, well, you see them. I forgot they're up there. 
The things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hand does not defile the man. The reason he's saying that is the Pharisees were always saying, eh, 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 you, you broke the law, you ate without washing your hands. Of course, they were in a cornfield. And uh, the Lord is calling them on it. Uh, boy, uh, I think they wish they hadn't called him on that after he got through with them. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful. It's deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? I, under, I know this from the King James. The heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? That's our heart. We're not talking about just the antediluvian. That's, is that just unbeliever's heart? No, that's our heart. That is what we are naturally. And God has given us the grace to overcome these. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. But that siren call of licentiousness and wickedness stirs the heartstrings of our old sin nature as believers. And we can very easily go to the dark side as well. We're in a period of grace. We better use it. I'd like everyone to please bow your heads. This last portion of this service is dedicated to those who don't know what's going to happen to them after they die. They can suppose what may happen, but they're frightened. They don't know the good news. They're frightened they might wind up in hell. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the one that went to the cross, died for our sins. He took our punishment. The penalty is upon him. He rose from the grave and now he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust him and him alone for it. More than anything else, the issue in the gospel is are you going to depend on your own good works or are you going to depend on Christ's perfect work? Your works are as filthy rags as the way God sees it. So you have this opportunity right now in your mind or if you want to, uh, out loud if you're at home. This is the moment that you're believing in Jesus Christ and trusting Him and His work for eternal salvation. And the moment you do that, you're born again. You become a royal family member of the Most High. And you have the opportunity to grow in grace. Father, thank You for this time that we can go back so far in history and know that You are God then as well in control of all things, a righteous and just God, but also a merciful God that delivered eight who sought you and trusted in you. We pray that this will be important to us, that we'll meditate on it, think about it, and see your faithfulness in it all. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.